Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This episode is brought to you by Boombox Gifts, memory boxes filled with personal messages and photos from friends and family for your next special occasion. Check it out at boomboxgifts.com. Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Michael Reichert, who's the founding director of the Center for the Study of Boys and Girls' Lives at the University of Pennsylvania, and who has conducted extensive research globally. He has served as the supervising psychologist at an independent boys' school and has created and led a program to enhance boys' literacy. He writes a column for Psychology Today called The Power of Connection. His book, How to Raise a Boy, The Power of Connection to Build Good Men, is his latest so welcome, Dr. Reichert, to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks for coming on. Glad to be here with you, Zibby, and, and, and with your listeners. Aww. How to Raise a Boy, the book, is like my manual now. Thank you so much for writing this. I have two sons. One's about to be 12 and one's four and a half. So I will be picking your brain for the next half an hour. <laughs> Can you tell listeners what inspired you to write How to Raise a Boy and basically what it's about? Yeah, sure. You know, I've been in the field of boyhood studies for close to 30 years, one way or another, you know, working as a clinician, working as a researcher, working in a boys' school for 30 years. And it just seemed to me that it was time to get real about the nature of boyhood. I think a particular tipping point for me was a meme that began to grow about boys are broken. Mm. And, and I know boys. I, I have boys. I have a grandson. I work with boys. And I, I, I know they're not broken. I do believe we're reaching a tipping point or, a, a, you know, a, a point of disruption when I think that boyhood, we're able to really acknowledge what's going on with the boyhood that we construct for boys. And I think that what I wanted to do was to be more rigorous about the science of human development and how it applies to male development in particular and to make the connection between the outcomes we're not happy with, the broken outcomes, and violations of boys' fundamental human natures. That's really the thrust of the book that I wrote. Excellent. You actually start your book with a sort of terrible, dramatic story of your younger brother dying in a car accident a long time ago. And I'm so sorry about that. I was not expecting it in the book and it just broke my heart. And you wrote that you, at the time, had started working as a family court counselor. And you linked these two things. You said you felt like there was a common thread between the boys you were helping and what had been going on with your brother, who I guess had been struggling with some things before the accident. And you said it was their maleness, I'm going to quote, a confounded sense of self, some degree of numbness, disconnection, and mental isolation. So talk to me (laughs) about all this. There's a wallop in there, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I should first say that that I came from a family of six children born in nine years. Wow. And that, that brother that I'm talking about in that story was a middle child, in some ways the invisible middle child. And, you know, his accident was a shock, I think, to all of us in my family. And in the way that we do when we're trying to understand tragedy, I think I just began chewing on it. And it happened that I was working with primarily young males in the family court system in Delaware. And I began seeing symptoms a lot like the way that my brother had been struggling prior to his accident. And I think I, you know, it was, it was the mid-70s and the women's movement had raised male consciousness about gender in some interesting ways, piqued my curiosity. And I think when I reflected on my clients, my brother, you know, the work of the men's movement that I was sort of a part of, I think what I realized was that there was something about the devaluing of life, numbness, I use the word disconnection. What I mean by that is not really feeling other people in their hearts, but being somewhat cut off. You know, we we historically have referred to that quality as independence, Mm. and we've really valorized it in male development, but I think in a way that has violated the most the fundamentally relational nature of human beings, boys included. And I think what I began to consider at that time, you know, a long time ago now, was that, that there was something 
wrong with the ideas that had driven the way that the people caring for boys had had recognized why and where things were going off track. I think that that's really why I included that story. I wanted to make it, I wanted to ground it in my personal experience, connect it to the broader issue of what's, you know, ways that, that boys are, are going awry and try to draw in some current research and thinking about boyhood studies and male development. Because things have changed so much since that happened. Yeah. And now we sort of need this even more, I would argue, right? The women's movement has this resurgence now, and what happens to the boys in the face of that, really? Yeah, I think that, that, that that's the other reason maybe that I wrote this book now, is I actually think we're ready. Mm-hmm. We're actually ready to consider. I, I, you know, when I started the project at the boys' school outside of Philadelphia, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. We struggled for how to name it. The school wanted to do it because there was some mistrust or misgiving about an all-boys school in the, at that point in time. That would have been the late 80s, mid-80s. And a lot of boy schools were converting to co-education because of that misgiving. This school decided it, it wanted to, needed to stay dedicated to boys, but wanted to do it with a new rigor. Asked me to create a, a, a national research advisory group and, and double down on understanding male development and boys' education. So I did that, and we tried to figure out what to name it. And our first thought was to name it after the head of the school at the time was a former dean at Hobart College and had created a men and masculinities symposium there. And we thought, great name, we'll just, you know, we'll just replicate that at this secondary school. We field tested it, and we discovered that people in response to that name assumed one of two things. Either that we were going to take boys out into the woods to beat their chests and celebrate their masculinity, trumpet their masculinity, or we were going to turn them into sissies. Mm. <laughs> Got rid of that name. Uh, <laughs> decided that the next, next one we tried was a men's studies project. Mm. And that was kind of a ho-hum. Yep. So we wound, up, we wound up naming the project, the program, the On Behalf of Boys Project, trying to seize the moral high ground. And that flew. I like that. Yeah, yeah, that worked. Yeah. I think that was the the impetus for that work. And I think what I found at the beginning was there was so much mistrust of, you know, any any particular attention to boys that it might rob the women's movement and the resources going to girls, the uplift of girls. And I think that that was sort of the current we were swimming against. What I see today I think as girls and women are feeling much more secure in the new opportunities, the new gender landscape, I think what I'm saying today is there's a lot of curiosity, almost a hunger for an equivalent understanding of boys and men. So then it's perfectly timed. That was the point. There you go. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. You make a lot of suggestions of what people can do to help raise their boys in a, in a healthy, wonderful way. And one of the things is having an ally and how that can help boys resist some of the harmful, you know, unhealthy cultural norms that are going around. So what are some tips? Let's say you want to be an ally of a boy to help him through. What are some tips? You talk a lot about the kinds of listening that you can do to help boys out. And it was just in this Wall Street Journal article you did. Tell me about the listening and how you can help be an ally to a boy. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. First of all, let me say that the concept of strengthening boys' resistance by providing them with what we call a relational anchor, I think just a sentence or two about that. You know, we don't need, I'm not recommending in this book, snowplow or helicopter parenting. You know, I think our concept of, you know, boys, I think our our efforts on behalf of boys in terms of strengthening boys' independence and individuality, I don't think that we're trying to take that down. I actually think, you know, we got that part right. Children are unique and independent creatures, and they have a right to their own mind and their their own direction for their life. What I am arguing, though, is that there are, there's a force that our sons have to contend with, these cultural norms, whether we call them man box norms or, you know, toxic masculine norms, whatever it might be, those norms are going to continue in our culture at least for a generation. I don't see that changing. In fact, in some ways, it's intensifying right now. Your son 
my grandsons are having to contend with that. My wife and I discovered right off the bat that we were not going to be able to circle our wagons and protect our sons from the influence of those norms. What we can do, what you can do with your son, what your listeners can do with their sons, is we can strengthen their ability to think for themselves. And the way to do that is to strengthen their hearts and their connection to themselves. And the way to do that is to provide the resource of attention, listening. What I say is every boy should be known and loved by at least one person, hopefully more. Hopefully they find that in their schools with a teacher or a coach. But, you know, known and loved by at least one person. And the the most fundamental way to know someone is to listen to them. It's amazing. I, I, I lead this emotional literacy group at this boys' school for 17 and 18 year old boys. And what they uniformly say is it's rare that someone actually pays attention to them, Hmm. independent of what they do. A lot of people are paying attention to how they perform academically, athletically, socially. But to actually pay attention to them, independent of any particular outcome we're seeking from them, but to look in on their hearts, their minds, know them, and, and come at them essentially with no agenda other than to know them, That's a rare gift. So, you know, the first quality in listening involves attention. You're listening to me right now, and what you're giving me is the blessing, really, of an open mind. You're absorbing what I'm saying. Whatever thoughts you have, whatever reactions you have, you're doing a great job of keeping them to yourself. (laughs) (laughs) We don't do that often with our children, and particularly with our sons. I think we come at our sons with worries, desires, hopes, urgent needs. We find something they're doing or saying troubling to us or irritating to us. And within a very short time of being with a boy, often we find ourselves intervening, switching in a certain sense the spotlight from them to us, what's on our minds. And what boys do is that they withdraw from that. They begin keeping things to themselves. They don't really want to have to deal with their parents' reactions if they can avoid it. And so what they do is they learn to turn to their video games with their friends or their music or whatnot, you know, their TV shows. And, you know, unfortunately, what happens then is they're deprived of that oxygen, that personalities, that character needs to grow and become strong. We are the providers of that particular form, that that nurture, that oxygen. And it comes in the form of attention and listening. So basically, I should interview my son next. I'll put him right here. (laughs) Well, you know, your son, you know, is receiving messages. And this is probably worth saying to a mother. (laughs) You know, he's receiving messages that he shouldn't be particularly close to his mom. And mothers are receiving messages that they shouldn't endeavor to keep their 12-year-old sons close to them. The mama's boy myth, I think, really, really weighs in on on mother-son relationships in heavy ways. And so, you know, your son might not sit in this chair at the outset. (laughs) And if he does sit in this chair, he might be so constrained that he might not find a way to open up. What I recommend is go and just sit next to him wherever he is and hang out with him and pay attention to him. And as you do that, you know, it's, it's really like a plant to light. Mm-hmm. What you offer is irresistible. And I think if you stay with offering that, you know, one time, two times, you know, a dozen times, he will lean into it on his own terms for his own reasons He may not satisfy you that he's responding in a way that you recognize. But I've been amazed in in my work with boys at how they take things in and only cautiously reveal Hmm. the depth to which they're registering your attention. But ultimately, the proof will be in the pudding is what I say. Stay with and keep an eye on what you're, what you're seeing. And I'm confident and certain, actually, that you will find that your son is using your attention, your listening, in ways that he needs to. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, it's sure. nice to know he hears. <laughs> <laughs> so 
That was so much really great stuff. You said in the book, to repair boyhood, we must first acknowledge its problems and reach a common understanding of its causes. So what do you think the major problems of boyhood are, aside from what you've already touched on? Well, you know, the outcomes are not great. The developmental outcomes are not great. You know, if we look at, for example, and this is really, you know, I guess referencing my brother and so many other males, the premature mortality rates mm-hmm. are 75% in the, in the age category 15 to 30 or 75% male. And it's preventable. It's lifestyle choices. You know, it's taking risks. It's doing unprotected sex. It's drinking too much, driving crazy, you know, whatnot. Not doing routine things to take care of our health. Not tending to or caring for our bodies but being pushed really by that kind of hyper-masculine peer norms to do crazy things. So, you know, I think that the outcomes are not great. That's one problem. And when I thought, going all the way back to that, that period, you know, in the late, late 80s, when I thought about what underlies that, what I concluded was that in the same way that our environment is hardwired with limits. There's a lot of elasticity in the environment, but only up to a point. And at a certain point, pollution begins to mount and we see signs of an ecosystem that's failing. I think in the same way, human development is very, very resilient up to a point. If we violate basic human needs though, there's going to be poor outcomes. I think in the case of male development, that violation takes place at the level of connection. Too many boys are not known and loved. For too many boys, there's no one paying attention to them, no one really anchoring them in a relationship to some sense of moral accountability. Too many boys are adrift and out there sort of free to do what they want without any sense of connection or, you know, owing to somebody else a sense of being a good man and no internal, I think, compass guiding them to take care of themselves, value themselves. So I, that's where I see the fundamental problem of boyhood. We have not prioritized connection in boys' development. Just the opposite, I think. We've prized independence in this ill-conceived way. So it goes back to the whole connection piece I and think being so. there. Yeah, the most basic. You know, we human beings, and you know, the, the, the field of interpersonal neuroscience didn't exist 30 years ago particularly. This is, this is a body of research that's really confirmed that human minds are wired to connect. Mm, mm-hmm. You know, our species prioritizes connection. We become people in the context of our relationships with somebody else, with other people. I look, you know, the most basic understanding, for example, of self-concept development is that I am who I think others see me as. So we need to reflect to our sons who we see them as, that they are treasured by us, that they are known by us, that they're interesting, that they're delightful, independent of what they do for us. Love it. Okay, so what else? I'm trying to raise the perfect boy. <laughs> you have a lot of other things like advocating for your son, offer relationships with the, you know, to show it, promote a strong sense of self, encourage emotional expression, exercise authority, and promote autonomy. Like, what are the most important things to take away on how to raise a, a well-adjusted, happy boy? Well, you know, it's, it's probably important. Assuming to, those are the goals, <laughs> which I think are my goals. So. Well, I'm, I'm sure they're the goals for many of your listeners, too. I think that it's important to talk about the value of setting limits with boys. I think there's a lot of confusion about that, both for parents, but also for teachers and coaches, in my experience. What we know, for example, in schools is that boys predominate in disciplinary realm, you know, whether it's, you know, demerits at schools or punishments or suspensions or expulsions, it's, it's, it's male. So, you know, we know that, let's see if I can say this simply, how a child regulates themselves is in some internalization of their parents or the authority figures in their lives, people that they respect and trust become a part of themselves, a conscience, we call it. For many boys, if those connections have been weakened, 
are broken and there's no conscience really guiding them or their conscience has become weaker or obscured by peer pressure or whatnot, it's likely that boys are going to act out. And it happens at a real micro level. It happens at a real major level. So consequently, the discipline, setting limits with boys, is a really important parenting skill. But it's, it's, it's critical to understand that when we're setting a limit with a boy, unless there really is a, a dire circumstance, we're playing a long game, not a short game. What we're trying to build is their capacity to self-regulate. So what that means is we don't simply step in, dominate the boy, use our power to make them afraid or shame them into compliance. We can always do that, and it happens all the time in boys' lives. You know, that kind of tisk, 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 finger-wagging, you know, shaming or that threat, you know, or that punishment. I'm going to take your Game Boy away or I'm going to, you know, send you to your room. That's all possible to do, but in my experience, not particularly skill-building. Mm-hmm. It's important for your son, though, to know that there's limits and that he's accountable. And so I describe the listen, limit, listen model for exercising authority. And basically what it, it is a long game version of limit setting. And basically the idea is the first step is to make sure you're clear headed, that you're not coming into the situation irritated or urgent. So your, your son just, you know, says something mean to your daughter. Mm-hmm. You're upset. You come into that situation, you're likely to convey your upset to your son in a way that's going to make him embarrassed or ashamed or angry. You didn't understand, Mom, what she did to me, da 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 you know? That kind of defensiveness. He's not learning. Were you watching what went on here over the weekend? No? Okay. Yeah. He's not listening to you. He's simply shielding himself from what he perceives to be your disconnection and your criticism of him. He's not really feeling you bolstering his sense of self. He's feeling you exiling him to the realm of bad boys. Okay. And, and so the first step, the listen step, is to check yourself, come at that problem with a clear mind when you can, and then making sure that what's happening actually is your son being off base, as opposed to something in the situation that really warranted that response. But if he's truly, you know, you know, mistreating his sister, that's not who he is, that's certainly not your family value. It makes sense to step in, and the way to step in is warmly, calmly, firmly, and to say, Jack, I'm not going to let you hurt Nellie. That's not who you are. That's not what we do. What's going on? And to step in, move into his space, let him feel you. He's being driven by some, some emotion that he probably doesn't recognize. It's energy that's driving him off course, and he requires intervention. But the intervention he requires is someone checking the acting out and inviting him to express that emotion directly, not in a, in a way that's harmful or undermining of his own personal character and values. So the third step is listen, and that's really the payoff. The point of setting a limit is that third step where your son melts down or explodes or tells you, you know, in some way or other, verbally or, or you know, with behavior, what's really driving him. And that's what you want him to be able to do is to process that painful emotion. You become his counselor, his container, his holding environment, we psychologists say. You become the person who is receiving the energy that's been driving him off course. He has needed to get that off his chest. He hasn't been able to do it by sitting down and talking the way adults do. He's acting it out. And he's trusting you to recognize that He's not a bad boy. He's the same boy he was, you know, an hour ago or last night. He's your dear son. And he's off course because something is happening that he needs to get off his chest. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to practice that. (laughs) It's hard work because often we have reactions to our sons. You know, boys, the way that boys act out is provocative often. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we think it's mean or it's, or it's evil or it's, you know, despicable, shameful. 
And that's what I see a lot when I, you know, I've been working in the field for a long time and I, I'm often in the position with teachers or coaches or parents where what boys have been doing is really awful. And I try to indicate to them that as the adults, it's actually not, it interferes with their ability to function as a helpful person in relation to that child if their reactions are dominating their minds. He feels you. He feels at a really fundamental level in, in his reptilian brain. He feels your painful emotion, and he doesn't know how to access you as a resource in that moment. I love that. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Going to focus on being a repository of energy, some sort of... And then you can go and talk to your husband about, uh, you know, what's upsetting to you. Oh, perfect. All right. <laughs> we'll all be venting our feelings around here all the time. <laughs> Chef back in with us in a few weeks. It's just before we go, I know the Me Too movement is like such a big thing right now. How do you raise sons to sort of be aware of that and to navigate that complexity of the world we live in? Yeah, you know, I, I'm actually not worried about that. I know lots of parents of boys are. I had one father of athletic boys, high school age boys, say that he, he had a talk. He sat down and had a talk with his sons and said, you've got a target on your back, you know simply by virtue of being big, athletic boys. I don't actually think that we have to presume to tell our sons how to navigate a changed gender landscape. I think they see it better than we do. Um, And I think when we do that, we're projecting our upset feelings about this new world onto our sons' perceptions of things. I actually think our best way to guide our sons, this is certainly true for me with my sons, is to make sure that they have somebody who knows and loves them, somebody that they're accountable to, and to trust that their natural sense of empathy and justice and respect will be the foundation of how they build relationships with women. And and that certainly, I think, uh, uh, has proven true in my experience. I meet with 40 or 50 boys every other week at this school And we talk about topics like, you know, difficult topics, topics like relationships with parents and relationships with each other and bullying, relationships with girls, sex, pornography. And I'm I'm very reassured um, by what I'm hearing from those boys about the inherent goodness and inherent commitment to real connection and relationship unless something's driving them off course. And there's lots of forces that would drive boys off course, but they're not inherent to who the boys are. There's ideas out there, you know, there's, there's stereotypes of boys as feral predators, you know, sex-driven, hormone-dominated creatures. And that's just nonsense. Not true. As you know with your son. So any last parting advice to parents of boys that they cannot forget? <laughs> well, you know, what I say is if you want your son to hold on to himself, you have to hold on to him yourself. That's a good one. You should put that on some bookmarks. (laughs) (laughs) I'm serious. Hand that out. All right. Well, thank you so much for all of your insights and help and and all of your time. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Sibby. This episode has been brought to you by Boombox Gifts, memory boxes filled with personal messages and photos from friends and family for your next special occasion. Boomboxgifts.com. Thanks to Ryan and Steve at Texture Sound for the audio editing and mixing. Thanks for listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. (laughs) 